Islam reformed the status of women through revelation and the prophetic conduct. To begin with the sacred text, the Quran brought a notion of unity and inclusivity that emerges from diversity. Let's take a look at chapter 49, verse 13. It embraces different genders and ethnicities under the inclusive and unifying concept of humankind, positing an opportunity for discovering the divine within differences. We know that differences can often escalate into bases for discriminations, but the Quran frames diversity of gender and ethnicity as a pedagogical tool for seeking interconnectedness and learning from shared experiences and concerns. Another aspect of the Quranic paradigm is that it focuses on the self as the first creation, which is a gender inclusive term, rather than naming the gender of the first human creation who, as understood by Muslims, was Adam. Verse 1 of chapter 4 states that God created the self and then its mate from it. Scholars such as Asma Barlas and Rifat Hassan highlight that the term nafs is feminine. So literally translated, the verse would mean created you from a single self and created her mate from her. Nonetheless, the self is among the many gender inclusive concepts in the Quran. According to the sacred text, the human being is a composite of soul, body, and self. Two out of these three components are gender inclusive. And gender distinction applies to the corporeality and not to the spirituality and intellectuality of human beings. A third feature of the Quran is that it does not condone the creation of Eve from Adam's rib narrative and does not condemn Eve as a temptress. Verses 20 to 23 of chapter 7 in the Quran talk about Satan tempting both Adam and Eve. I explore this concept deeply in my article, Five Foundational Women in the Quran, which is available in the resources added to this video. A fourth avenue for gender-inclusive discourse in the Qur'an is about equal access to virtue and ethics. Now, if I were to use a vehicle metaphor to understand the human nature, then the human body would be the car. The spirit, soul, would be the fuel. And the self, nafs, would be the driver. And we find that the Qur'an often addresses the nafs, the driver, the decision-making faculty in the human in matters of virtue ethics. A good example of this is chapter 91, verses 7 to 10. The selfhood emerging from these verses is clearly gender-inclusive. Verse 195 of chapter 3 and verse 97 of chapter 16 clearly proclaim equal rewards for all those who strive for doing good, regardless of their gender. Finally, the Quran includes women as God's representatives and role models for humanity. Verses 11 and 12 of chapter 66 name Mary and the Pharaoh's wife as ideals for people of faith, women and men. For a deeper analysis of these verses, please refer to my article that I mentioned earlier. Besides what I have already highlighted, there are several Quranic verses that affirm women's right to education, financial independence, inheritance, and political affiliation. You will find a list of these verses with the additional resources. As for the prophetic conduct, the fact that he worked for Khadija, 
a woman he later married, shows his appreciation for strong, educated women. Even before Islam was proclaimed, Khadija led studies of the scriptures, was an established businesswoman, and gave refuge to abandoned female infants. When they had their daughter Fatima, the Prophet celebrated her birth as a manifestation of chapter 108 of the Quran, and he raised her with love and respect. Whenever she would enter the room, he would rise to receive her and offer his seat to her. Later, he declared that his lineage would continue in her children. Such consideration for daughters was alarming for the 7th century Arabian society, which was plagued by female infanticide and seeking male heirs for succession. So the Quran and the prophetic example worked in tandem to bring empowerment to the female condition. Many women come to mind. First, Khawla whose narrative is mentioned in chapter 58 of the Quran. The chapter is named Al-Mujadila, which literally means the arguing woman. It begins with the story of Khawla, who persisted in complaining about her husband's misconduct, eventually resulting in the revelation of verses which drastically changed the legal implication of women in her situation. Again, for more details on Khawla's narrative, you can see the article that is attached. Another woman is Esma bint Umais. She and her husband led the first Muslim migrants to Africa. When she returned after a few years, she asked about what had been revealed to the Prophet in her absence. After reviewing the verses, she came to see the Prophet, complaining. It would be great if women were to be addressed distinctly in the Quran, rather than just including them under the category of those who believe. The voicing of her preference resulted in the revelation of verse 35 of chapter 33. This verse delineates ten virtues, each distinctly addressing women of faith and men of faith. A third woman who comes to mind is Fidda al nubiya She was of African origin and had not only memorized the Quran, but was able to frequently integrate it in her daily parlance, such that if someone were to ask her, what's up, she would furnish an answer from the verses of the Quran. She spoke in the Quranic vocabulary for 20 years of her life. And while thinking about early Muslim women, how can I not talk about Fatima Zahra, the Prophet's daughter? Her sermon of protest was the theme of my dissertation research and the topic of my forthcoming book, Feminist Theology and Social Justice in Islam, a case study on the sermon of Fatima. I portray Fatima as a qualified theologian and a resilient socio-political activist who was ostracized not only because of her gender, but also because of her beliefs and her vociferous stand for justice. Her sermon is a testimony to Muslim female activist voices as early as the 7th century, which directly impacted their society's religious, cultural, and political landscape, and continue to play an inspirational role in the lived experiences of contemporary Muslims. I would say that it was the creeping up of pre-Islamic cultural biases towards women that made their way into Hadith literature. Ideas that had no basis in the Quran quickly became the cultural norm in Muslim societies. For example, first, nothing in the Quran supports that Eve was created from Adam's rib, yet Popular hadith books like Sahih Bukhari will ascribe such notions to the Prophet, who said that women were created from rib, and if you need to get derived benefit from them, you need to leave them crooked. 
Now, according to Asma Barlas and Barbara Stowasser, most early exegetes borrowed heavily from biblical traditions to fill the gaps in understanding Quranic narratives. These interjections came to be known as Isra'iliyat and are scattered in primary exegetical and biographical resources, complicating the work of locating the contributions of women to Islamic theology and exegesis. Second, even with all the emphasis on the pursuit of knowledge in Islam, most, if not all, Early Islamic scholarship comprises male historians, exegetes, and jurists. Why were women not given equal opportunities? Perhaps it was the power that came with affiliating with institutions and grants that supported such scholarship. It would not be surprising, given that even today, women fight for equal pay and equal opportunities in societies that claim to be progressive, equitable, and inclusive. Whatever the precise reason, there emerged a culture where women were charged with matters of caregiving and men took charge of leadership, which I argue is not a Quranic model. For if caregiving and leadership are human virtues, then all humans, regardless of their gender identities, should have equal access. Third, the common narrative advanced from the pulpits is that of assigning gender roles to women, such as obedient daughters, supportive wives, dedicated mothers, all of which are important to the female identity. But the primary significance of being a devoted believer is somewhat lost. In my travels over the decades across the Muslim world, I have come across women concerned about their spirituality because they are so burdened with societal expectations to perform such gender roles. Again, I am not saying that to strive to be a good partner and a good parent takes away from the feminine identity, but rather I am talking about a balance in life and the matter of agency. Finally, even where women want to reclaim their voices, they seldom find support from their communities and societies. Speaking up against oppressive cultural norms is often heard as rebelling against religion. The rhetoric of piety becomes commensurate to submitting to all norms, even those that might not be mandated by religion. And more often than not, women lose their agency in matters of pious conduct. So to the question, what caused the decline of Muslim women's empowerment over the centuries? I would say that it was the resurfacing of a pre-Islamic male dominance in culture, education, scholarship, and leadership. To make a long-term impact on the co-opting of religion, for denying women their rights, women must claim their stake in Quranic exegesis and its legal applications. This means more women in traditional Islamic seminaries. Here, I must clarify that while many Islamic seminaries welcome female students, and at least in the case of Iran, hundreds graduate each year, there are no professional positions available for them. Their best prospect, in most cases, is marriage or a voluntary educational position in a community. These qualified women scholars inevitably find themselves advancing the male-dominated system by working under male religious leadership. Sadly, the position of Muslim women in the West is not acutely different from their counterparts overseas. There are Islamic centers in the U.S., each typically led by a board of trustees, very few of which include women. Also, most Islamic centers here have a position designated for a religious resident scholar. This position is often a fully funded position supported by the congregation. 
Except for a couple of Islamic centers in England and Canada, I am yet to encounter an Islamic center in the U.S. where the professional position of a resident religious scholar is awarded to a female. The challenges that Muslim women in the U.S. face in terms of access to religious leadership is also evident by the inadequate Muslim female representation in interfaith spaces. To overcome these challenges, women's voices that seek empowerment from within their own sacred text and tradition will undoubtedly play a vital role. Take, for example, women being forbidden from driving in Saudi Arabia, only until recently. Nothing in the sacred text disallows women's movement in such a manner, or that, until recently, single women were denied Hajj visas because the government only admitted women who were accompanied by male relatives. According to the Quran, the Hajj pilgrimage is a key tenet of Islamic practice. Incumbent on all those who are physically and financially able to make the journey. Adding a requirement of an accompanying male relative has no religious backing. Another example is the policing of piety, especially when it comes to women's bodies and veiling. Piety is the most desired form of worship in Islam, and as such, it must be done willingly. Agency is key to Islamic doctrine and practice. The Quran does not condone forced conversions. People cannot be forced to accept Islam, nor can they be forced to practice piety. Here I am not mitigating the Islamic virtue ethics of enjoining good and forbidding evil. Rather, I am saying that we have no precedence in the prophetic practice to support the notion of coercive worship. For piety to account from worship, it must emanate from divine love and agency. Fiza Shah had a dream. She wanted quality education available to underprivileged Pakistani children. Compelled by the belief that all children should have equal opportunity to reach their greatest potential, she was committed to delivering affordable and high quality education. So in 1998, she founded Development in Literacy, Dil, which puts the child at the heart of all actions. She successfully established hundreds of schools that educated thousands of underserved children particularly girls, throughout Pakistan's four provinces. Their teaching methods use technologically driven learning, rigorous teacher training, tailored curricula, and project-based activities. This diverse and deep learning enables students to apply the concepts they learn to everyday life while exploring the farthest limitations of their imagination. Dil, which means heart, in Urdu, operates a total of 138 schools that currently serves over 29,000 students in Pakistan. The schools are distributed across 11 projects covering three provinces in Sindh, Khyber, Pashtunwala, and Punjab, and in some federal territories in Islamabad. Dil provides a child-friendly school, technology-driven learning, teaching to teach, and e-libraries and career preparations. Fourteen hundred years ago, Khadija, the wife of Prophet Muhammad, managed the largest trading business in Mecca. Today, Saudi Arabia's stock exchange, the Dawul, is the largest stock market in the Middle East. And surprisingly, it is chaired by a woman, Sarah al suhaimi Many people are surprised to learn that a woman is charged with an exchange whose market cap is $2.7 trillion. 
This stock exchange is a hub of wealth creation where stockbrokers and traders buy and sell securities, shares of stocks and bonds and other financial instruments. It carries out listings and trading in securities as well as deposits, transfer, clearing, settlements and registry of ownership of securities. Al Suhaimi's business acumen is evident. She was appointed in 2017 and reappointed again in 2020 to another three-year term. Her career in finance took hold in 2014 when she became the first woman to run a Saudi investment bank. She serves as a CEO of NCB Capital, the largest Sharia compliant asset managers in the world with over 37 billions of assets under her management. Hashima Hassan is the James Webb Space Telescope Deputy Program Scientist and the Education and Public Outreach Lead for Astrophysics at NASA. She was born in Lucknow, India, but she was always curious and loved to explore nature. After she graduated with a BSc degree from Lucknow University, she went on to pursue a master's degree in physics from Aligarh Muslim University. There, she graduated as a gold medalist. Hashima then went on to pursue a PhD and received a Commonwealth scholarship and joined the University of Oxford, where she pursued a DPhil in theoretical nuclear physics. She was awarded a fellowship by the U.S. National Research Council, where she pursued atmospheric science. Hashima Hassan oversees and manages the science program and is the program scientist for many NASA missions. She led the astronomy and physics research and analysis programs from 2001 to 2006, establishing policy overseeing the entire RNA budget and reorganizing research programs to align with NASA's strategic goals. She has published articles in peer-reviewed journals and has been honored with prestigious awards and fellowship. But Hashima's most delightful moment was when one of James Webb's telescopic top discoveries were the first direct image of an exoplanet. Scientists discovered the first exoplanet in the 1990s, and there are about 3,000 known worlds orbiting faraway stars. Still, only around two dozen of these have been imaged directly. Most exoplanets are so far away that they can only be detected through a dip in the light of the star they're orbiting when the planet passes in front of its host star. But Webb changed all that. In September, it captured its first direct image of an exoplanet. Anushi Ansari was the first female private explorer, first astronaut of Iranian descent, first Muslim woman in space, and fourth private explorer to visit space. She was born in pre-revolution Iran and emigrated to the United States as a teenager. She started the communication firm Telecom Technologies, Inc. after earning her master's in electrical engineering from George Washington University. She and her family made a donation to the X Prize Foundation in 2004, which supports inventive solutions to social and environmental problems. When she launched on the Soyuz TMA-9 in 2006 with Space Adventures Limited, she made history as the first Muslim woman in space. She was one of only two women included on Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40 list in 2001 and the first person to post a blog from space. In 2014, Shireen Kankan announced that she planned to build Denmark's first women's mosque, focusing on families. She hoped to bring together traditionalist Muslim and younger, more progressive ones, such as herself, who had felt not at home in Islam. Khan was accused by conservative people of diluting Islam. She countered that the goal of the mosque was to bring together people whom the conservatives have pushed away from their faith. So in 2016, Khan Khan's dream came true. She founded the Maryam Mosque 
in Copenhagen, named for the Arabic form of Mary. She and Saliha Marie Fette served as co-imams for Denmark's first women's mosque. At the opening, the Adhan, the call to prayer, was recited by Khan Khan in a clear, feminine voice. Fata, fluent in Arabic, delivered the sermon, called the Khutbah. The Maryam Mosque is an all-inclusive mosque. But when offering Friday prayer, the mosque is exclusively for women. At all other times, men and women can come and pray, but in the mosque, women lead only women in prayer. Besides being an imama, Han Khan is a lecturer, author, columnist, and activist. She holds an MA in Sociology of Religion and Philosophy from University of Copenhagen. She's also the founder and CEO of Exit Circle, an NGO which provides self-help groups for people subjected to psychological violence. Sheikha Hasina served as Prime Minister of Bangladesh three times from 1996 to 2001, 2009 to 2014, and 2014 to today. One head of state whose leadership has altered the course of her nation is none other than Sheikha Hasina. Like her predecessors in Islamic history, her tenacious, bold, fearlessness and pragmatic approach explains the economic success of her country, Bangladesh. As the longest serving prime minister in the history of Bangladesh and the longest serving female head of government for any nation, her total combined time of service is 18 years. Sheikha Hasina has blended her philosophy of capitalistic and socialistic virtues. She has broken monopolies, created intense competition between companies and open up the public sector to private companies, including health, banking, higher education, media, export processing, and economic zones. Of the 60 million in the workforce, 18.6 million are women. The country is the second largest garment manufacturer in the world, employing 3.2 million. Hasina, has demonstrated how women in leadership can serve the entirety of their citizens. And in Bangladesh, women are prominent both in politics and commerce. The single most decisive factor behind Bangladesh's astonishing success is that Prime Minister Hasina has infused a sense of confidence in the national psyche of her people, especially among young women and youth. She has elevated the poorest and the most neglected people of her populous nation by expanding welfare programs. Hasina was elected during a terminal time in the history of Bangladesh and has helped develop the country, bringing many people out of poverty. In addition to Hasina, it is remarkable that 15 female heads of state have led Muslim majority nations and they include the Prime Minister of Indonesia, of Pakistan, of Kosovo, of Kyrgyzstan, Turkey, Mali, Senegal, Mauritius, Gambia, Tanzania, Tunisia, Singapore, Northern Cyprus, and again in Iran, a woman who is Vice President in charge of environmental protection. In Morocco, United Arab Emirates, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia, women also serve as foreign ministers and ambassadors. The continuous linkage of Muslim women's oppression to the religion of Islam is wrong and has produced far-reaching consequences, especially for young women who are unable to reconcile their Islamic identity because they feel victimized and alienated from their religion and respective societies. Although the principles of Islamic jurisprudence guarantee a full suite of women's rights and universal human dignity and equality is at the core of the Islamic faith, personal bias against women's equality and distorted interpretation of scripture and some customary practices have crept in and have stripped women 
of their inalienable Islamic rights. For example, the sudden withdrawal of the U.S. and allied forces after two decades in Afghanistan has markedly changed the landscape where women's education has suddenly stopped and there is an increased urgency of work to protect the rights of women and girls. Yet, Muslim women do not see faith as an impediment to their advancement because there is ample evidence and Quranic support for the rights of women. For instance, the Quran gives us right to education, career, leadership, divorce, and it classified in the six objectives of Sharia, which is the right to life, intellect, religion, dignity, family, and wealth. We have 30 rights and 30 protections in Islam. So the need of the hour is to equip women and girls with an egalitarian framework, which will enable them to redefine their roles within the Islamic context in countries where their rights are being stripped. So the part of the struggle is to empower women and girls so that they can integrate their beliefs into their activism and be at the forefront of debates surrounding their rights. And this is going to require disentangling the universal tenets of Islamic law from the varying customs, revealing the socially inherited practices that often get conflated with Islamic principles. This is going to require us to increase the literacy among young women so that they can find ways to express their rights within Islam and prevent the imposition of outdated attitudes towards them. This is going to require us to re-establish Muslim women's authority in faith-based societal discourse. And then we have to increase women's literacy in all these countries so they can integrate their religious beliefs in their social movements. It is really important also to not undermine the men because if we build the capacity of influential religious leaders and teachers as well as the millennial audience who are at the tipping point in their lives, we can expect men to become champions for women and get rid of this religious expectation and limit limitation that is imposed on women. Finally, we have to empower women also with legal and religious support for self-determination and agency. And we have to provide them with the right kind of stories that inform, enlighten, and vouch for their rights within Islam.